Oh, man, how about a round of applause for the student band? Man, wow. Yes. Man, brought the Spirit of the Lord with them in here, man. It's good to see you guys all here today on 2023, man. This has been fun. It's been a blessing to be able to worship with you guys, lift up Jesus in this place. Welcome those of you on our live stream out there. Appreciate you being in here with us today. And uh, really great to see you guys, man. That was a great time of worship. I was over there uh, thinking, man, God always uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. That was, that was great, man. Anyway, January 1st, 2023, and you came to church, man. How about you give yourself, now let's give the Lord a round, hound clap, offering, say thank you, Lord, bringing a spirit in on the first day of the year, man. Hope you guys are having a good one. I, uh, I want to just say congratulations to TCU football for making it in the national championship. That was fun watching that, and uh, I've got my uh, middle daughter and son-in-law here from Georgia, so man, I thought they were going to throw up last night <laughs> before that. Georgia pulled out the wind down there. They were happy about that, and uh, so we had a lot of fun uh, doing that last night, and uh, it's good to be here with you today, man. This is always a good time of year. Kind of look back, right, at uh, 2022 and uh, look ahead to 2023, see how you can do better, not went wrong, not what went wrong in 22, but just how you can do better in 2023. And uh, this time of year, sometimes we think about goals we can set. So I kind of Googled it up, you know, top goals, resolutions for 2023, which I'm not sure how they knew this because I did it in 2022, but I guess they were taking a guess on what it was going to be. And the first one was, number one goal was to lose some weight. Second one was to exercise. Third one was to spend less or save more. And the fourth one kind of caught me off, off guard. I wasn't really thinking about this, but it was spend less time on social media, right? So I was kind of like, wow, I could probably do all four of those and my life would be a little bit better. Uh, that might be a worthy goal. But uh, well, what, what if there's something you could do in 2023 that would actually help you? that would actually make a difference in your life or your family's life or in your marriage or with your kids or even with your finances. One thing you could do that maybe would sum up all those other things because all those other things are, are all physical things that you try to accomplish. But what if the real goal in 2023 ought to be to set a spiritual goal? That what, what if the key is not to do something physical but it's to do something spiritual? Because what happens in the spiritual, what happens on the inside of you will re be revealed on the outside of you sooner than later, whether good or bad. In fact, if you want to just read a book on positive life change, people's whose lives that were changed and not only their lives but their family's lives or their friends' lives or the people that were around them, maybe their whole country's lives, if you want to look at people whose lives were changed, the best book you could read on that is the Bible. The Bible was basically just all full of stories about people whose lives were radically changed. When something happened in the spiritual, it was then revealed in the, in the physical. So you think about Abraham when he gets this call in his life to leave where he's at and go to a whole new country. And when he obeyed, it not only changed his life and his family's life, but literally it changed your life as well. Or, or you can think about somebody like Moses who's 80 years old when he has this encounter with God at the burning bush. God's got, I got something for you to do. And when he was obedient to do what God wanted him to do, go back down to Egypt until Pharaoh let my people go, it not only changed his life, but it changed the entire nation, like two million plus people's lives as well as they were set free from bondage. Or you can, we can talk about Rahab and, or, or we could talk about, you know, in the New Testament, somebody like Peter or, or Andrew or Levi, who was a tax collector and he made a spiritual decision that changed the course of his life. We can read about it today in the book of Matthew or somebody like Paul, who's a persecutor of the church one minute and the next minute. God so changed his life that we're still reading about him today that maybe I want to just say to you today, maybe the key is not to concentrate on the physical, but in 2023, we could concentrate on the spiritual. And I want to show you this today in a passage of scripture and two things I want to show you. I want to show you why it's important for you to concentrate on the spiritual in 2023. And number two, why you as a believer are important in 2023, incredibly important important if you're a believer in Jesus. And I want to do it from the from Old Testament passage, 1 Kings 19. So if you got your Bible, open up to 1 Kings chapter 19, three verses, 1 Kings 19, 19, 20, and 21. 1 Kings, look it up on your phone if you want to. We'll put it on the screen. 1 Kings 
chapter 19, verse 19 starts like this. Elijah went, or Elijah left there and found Elisha, son of Japhat, as he was plowing. Twelve teams of oxen were in front of him, and he was with the twelfth team. Elijah walked by him and threw his mantle over him, and Elisha left the ox and ran to follow Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. Go back, he replied, for what have I done to you? So he turned back from following him, took the team of oxen and slaughtered them. This is Elisha now. And when the oxen, and with the oxen's wooden yoke and plow, he cooked the meat and gave it to the people to eat, and then they left followed Elijah, then he left, followed Elijah, and served him. So this story starts out with a prophet named Elijah, who was a great prophet in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God spoke through prophets. So God would speak to, to men, prophets, and then they would speak to the people. So Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at various times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. In the Old Testament, this is how God spoke. God spoke to a prophet, and a prophet would speak to the people. And of all the prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah was one of the greatest. In fact, when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured before three of his disciples, when he pulled back his humanity and revealed his glory, two people appeared with him, it says in Matthew chapter 17. One of them was Moses and the other one was Elijah. And in a sense, Moses represented the law, the first part of the Old Testament, whereas Elijah represented the prophets, the law and the prophets, basically your Old Testament, and God wanted to show us that Jesus is better than both and is the fulfillment of both. Elijah, great Old Testament prophet, did a number of great miracles, man. He, he, he basically said it wasn't going to rain, and it didn't rain for over three years. Man, and why it didn't rain, God provided for him by the brook with ravens, and then he met this widow, and he said, your flour and, and oil will never run out as long as I'm with you, with you, and God multiplied it, and he actually raised this widow's son from the dead, raised somebody from the dead, called down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. I mean, he was a great prophet, and what he's doing in this particular passage of Scripture is he's basically calling Elisha to be his successor, Right? And he's doing that because God told him to do that. When he met with God on Mount Horeb and God spoke to him in that still small voice, it says in 1 Kings 19, 15, when the Lord said to him, Elijah, then the Lord said, go and return by the way you came to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. You're to anoint Jehu king o, uh, as king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Japhat, as prophet in your place. So basically, he comes up. He goes immediately and does it. He goes and finds Elisha. Elisha's plowing. 12 teams of oxen, either he was rich or his dad was rich, one or the other. He was a BTO, big time operator, right? And Elijah just walks up behind him and takes off his mantle, which was being like an outer cloak of some type. They believe it probably had fur on it. It was, a, uh, it was something he wore that people knew that was Elijah the prophet. It was a prophet's what they would wear. And he just took it off his shoulders, placed it on Elisha as he walks by, and apparently just kept on walking. But Elisha immediately knew what it was, that he was being called to be a prophet. So immediately, he says, can I go home, can I go kiss my father and mother? And Elijah's like, man, what's, it, what's that to do with me? In other words, hey, he, in one hand, it's like God's the one that did it. I'm not doing anything. That's between you and God. Or maybe is it what have I done for you? Just remember what's just happened to you. God's got a call on your life. So, yeah, you can go kiss your father and mother. Just don't stay too long. But Elisha's in it, man. He immediately goes back, kisses his father and mother, takes his plow and his yoke of oxen, builds a fire, kills the two oxen, sacrifices them, and then feeds the whole entire town. Before he goes to father, 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 follow. <laughs> I'm going to stayed up too late last night, babe. <laughs> basically, basically what Elisha makes a decision to do is follow God with all of his heart. And, and we see this same exact thing. This isn't just an Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see the same thing. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 As Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 
follow me. He said, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately left their nets and followed him. Follow me. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus meets Levi, who's a tax collector, and says, follow me. Immediately he gets up from his tax booth, leaves it behind, and began to follow Jesus. This idea of following God with all your heart. I propose to you the best resolution you could ever make would be today, before you left this place, or if you're listening to me in the live stream, to make a decision that you're just going to follow Jesus with all of your heart. No matter where he asks you to go, no matter what he asks you to do, you're just going to follow Jesus. That your goal in life becomes to do whatever he wants you to do. We can say to follow God, but you can't follow God unless you first know Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The only way to know the Father, to hear the Father, is through Jesus. There has to come a point, a decision in your life where you make just to follow Jesus. And I want you to know that in this particular passage of Scripture, when you see this call to follow go out, it's God always, God's always the one that initiates, and we follow. We don't make up stuff to do for God. We just say, we're going to do what you want me to do. This is the idea. I'm going to do what you want me to do, all right? So in any case in the Bible where you see great things about God, whether it's Moses, Moses initiates through the burning bush, whether it's Rahab, God sends two spies into, into Jericho, whether it's Elisha, God tells Elijah, anoint him, God initiates, we respond. I believe if you're here today or if you're there on the live stream, God's already initiated in your life because outside of God working in your life, you have no desire to follow God, no desire to know God. If you have any desire at all, it's because God is already working in your life. It's just an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus. doesn't matter what your profession is. We're talking about surrendering your life. It's about choosing a different path, all right? So here's the mistake we make. Most everybody in this room, if I were to ask you, I'd say, how you doing? you say, I'm doing pretty good. I got Jesus in my life. The problem is I'm not asking you to bring Jesus into your life. I'm asking you to surrender your life to Jesus. So it'll be like this. I'll demonstrate. I don't know if the camera can pick this up or not, but say I'm walking through life. I've got my, I've got my road I'm walking on, the way I think direction I'm going, what I'm doing, this is my road, I'm going through life, I'm walking on my road, I come down through here, and somewhere in the course of things, I get introduced to Jesus, I hear about Jesus, I think Jesus could help me, all right, so Scott, this is my son-in-law, Scott, can you guys give him a round of applause, Scott Irvin, this is, it's a great opportunity just to put him on the spot, all right, come on up here, uh, Scott, I'm on, you, you can represent Jesus, all right, all right. so now, I get Jesus in my life, and I'm thinking, man, Jesus can really help me. I have somebody to talk to. I can ask him for advice. I can go for him for power. Man, when I get in a jam, I'm just going to ask Jesus. Jesus in the car with me. I'm like walking down my road going, come along with me, Jesus. I'm great having you. When I die, I'm going to spend all eternity with you, man. I appreciate you being here with me. Well, I want you to notice what's happening. I'm actually still going on my same road. I'm just asking Jesus to come along with me. In reality, I'm still eating. I'm asking Jesus to follow. You get Jesus in your life, man. Jesus didn't come along to follow. He comes along to lead, right? So the course is not I'm going to walk. He's going to follow. No, I'm going to follow him. All right, everybody give Scott a round of applause. I wouldn't have done that if George had lost last night. I know you couldn't have taken it. But, but say, say you're walking down your life and Jesus, see, it's, it's not a road, it's a path. And the path that Jesus wants you to take is different. In other words, when you meet Jesus, it's not you're walking down the road and Jesus come along. Jesus goes on a different path. You've got to turn off the road you're on to follow Jesus. And, and, and that path, well, that's a narrow path. That might be a suffering path. That might be a, a path of hardship. You start following Jesus, man, people aren't going to understand you anymore. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to get on social media and say, what an idiot you are. Why would you make that decision? Well, maybe Jesus wanted me to make that decision, right? See, it's a, we think we're going to add Jesus on our life. What I'm talking about is forsaking your life 
and following Jesus where he wants you to take you. And, th and this is the idea of the New Testament. Matthew 7, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many that go through it. I mean, you're on a road and everybody's on this road. It makes sense to go this way. Jesus asks you to go a different path. I want to say the best thing you can do in 2023 is to make a decision to follow Jesus wherever he asks you to go. This is a decision. And if you do that by faith, faith always acts. You see Elisha, when he makes this decision, he goes, can I go kiss my mom and dad? Sure. And then, but he doesn't stay there. He goes and says goodbye to his mom and dad, who he's probably leaving a very, obviously, a very wealthy family. But he, doesn't all, he burns his farming equipment and sacrifices the oxen on top of it. In other words, he says, I ain't going back. Publicly. In front of the whole town, I'm going to go be a prophet. You guys all eat some of my old the meat because I ain't going back because I'm burning my bridges. He makes it public, all right? Now, if you're a believer in Jesus, Jesus wants you to make it public. And the first thing he wants you to do, just like we saw today, is to be baptized. If you're a believer in Jesus and you've never been baptized, can I just ask you Why? Say, well, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. I never have been baptized. If I get baptized now, what would people think? It don't matter what people think. It only matters what Jesus thinks, right? <laughs> this, is the, the, this is the commitment we're talking about. I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do. You have to act upon your faith. What's Jesus want me to do? So there, there's this sense when you talk about following Jesus. You, you make a decision all right, by faith, I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do. You act upon that faith. Faith always acts. If you think you've got faith in Jesus and there's no action, then your faith is not alive because faith without works is dead, All right? So you have to act upon your faith. You act upon your faith. Everyone who acknowledges me, Jesus says, before others, I'll acknowledge him before the Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I'll deny him to my Father in, in heaven. You have to act upon your faith and you have to take responsibility to become like the one that you follow. Th this is the idea that we become like Jesus. We follow Jesus so that we can become like Jesus. Elisha says, I'm going to follow you, Elijah, so I can learn what it means to be a prophet. What's it mean to be a prophet? I'm going to spend time with you. We know at least six years he spent just serving Elijah, doing nothing. It says in uh, 2 Kings 3, except pouring water on his hands. He was just his servant for six years because he wanted to know what it was like. If I'm called to be a prophet, I need to learn what it's like. If I'm called to be a follower of Jesus, why? Because I want to, become, I want to act like Jesus. I want to look like Jesus. Peter and Andrew left everything to follow Jesus because they wanted to, to be like Jesus. This is our objective. We have to take responsibility. I'm going to tell you, you can't follow Jesus apart from the word of God. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you don't, aren't, if you've got to take responsibility to know this, if you're going to follow Jesus. And the only way you can do that is you got to just make a decision, dude. I'm, I'm going to read it. I'm going to study it. I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to meditate it. I'm going to figure it out. In other words, if I said, hey, you could improve your finances if you would just start living your life according to the Bible. Then you're like, what does the Bible say about it? Well, it's right there. About your marriage. I would say to you, you could approve your marriage if you just did it like the Bible says to do it. You're like, well, what's the Bible say about marriage? I say it's right there. So you could you can take responsibility. You could read it, read it through in a year. Go on the Bible app. I read through the Bible, the chronological order a couple years ago. Sarah Lee Cobble in the Bible app, you know, uh, put download that thing and listen to it. You can read it. It tells you what to read each day. Uh, We've got one, Aaron's got one that's chronological. It's like the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. You could read the whole Bible through a year, start today, get on one of those plans. You could do it. You could join a Bible study, kind of about three or four weeks. We're starting men and women's Bible studies. Study the Bible, right? Make a decision that you're going to go to church in 2023.
right? That's worth a round of applause. What if you just made a decision, I'm going to go to church in 2023. Like my wife and I, even before we had called the ministry, we just, it's just what we did. We went to church. We didn't get up on Sunday morning and go, man, I wonder if we should go to church this morning. No, dude, we went to church. That's what we did. That's what followers of Jesus do because you need to be in community and you need to be around other people to encourage you to keep walking with Jesus. Take responsibility, right, to become like the one that you're following. Here's why that's important, okay? You've got Elisha. He was a very successful farmer. I'm not talking about what your profession is. It doesn't matter what your profession is, but he happened to be a farmer. You've got Peter and Andrew who were fishermen, all right? And they, they appeared to be pretty successful fishermen too because they had multiple boats. Their dad must have been pretty successful. Obviously, Elisha was a successful farmer. But here's the reality. God had something more for both of them. And if you just look at the stuff that Elisha experienced, Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. I mean, just read his story. The stuff that he saw God do, look at the apostle Peter. He might have been a really great fisherman, but the stuff that he saw God do, that he saw Jesus do, the people that were healed, the things Jesus said, the things that he went on to do. I mean, on the day of Pentecost, received the Holy Spirit, got up and preached to 5,000 people, had people healed, one of the great founders of the church. Think of all the stuff that he experienced, and it all started with one decision. I'm going to follow you, Jesus, and do whatever you want me to do. The reason it's important that you make that decision is... Because in and of ourselves, our brain, we like to be comfortable. We like pleasure. So if, you, if your brain, which most of us do what our brain tells us, it don't want to read the Bible. It wants to scroll on social media. About three hours in a row, just chill out. You ever wake up, be like, dude, what have I been doing for the last two hours? Nothing profitable. Why do you do that? Because your brain likes it. Why does your brain like to binge watch? Your brain likes to binge shop. <laughs> you know? Your brain likes to binge eat. Why? Because your brain likes to be comfortable. Can I tell you? God's got more for you than that. When you surrender to do what Jesus wants you to do, he changes your motivation. In other words, he empowers you to do what he wants you to do. This is the key. When you surrender to Jesus, like as long as you're living your life and ask Jesus to come along, you say, Jesus, help me, help me pass this test. Or like, Jesus, please let this police officer give me a warning and not a ticket. <laughs> right? You're asking Jesus to empower you to do what you want to do. But the minute you say, it ain't about me, I'm only going to do what you want me to do, Jesus, then it becomes Jesus' responsibility to empower you to do what he wants you to do. And he can empower you to do things that you can never do. So we're, our call is to take responsibility to become like Jesus, only do what Jesus wants to do. So Cindy and I were listening to a podcast the other day, and uh, this lady was talking about Lion King. How many people remember the Lion King out there? All right, the Lion King. So we got Lion King, you got Simba, his father dies, and Simba, you know, what's he do? He runs off in the wilderness, goes to La La Land, Kuna Matata Land, where he's just doing whatever he wants to do, right? He's having fun over there, doing whatever, and, uh, you know, just lollygagging through life, man, just doing what his brain wants to do, because it's all good. He's all over there. And, uh, and then one day, you know, he comes to realization maybe there's more in his life. And how does he come to that realization? You know, he sees a reflection of himself in a puddle of water. But when he sees the reflection of himself, he doesn't see himself. He sees his father in the puddle. And he realizes God's got more for me, right? And what's happening to the pride land while he's gone? Dude, it's basically on fire. It's being burned to the ground. It's being destroyed by the evil scar. Why? Because he's not doing what God's called him to do. And it's only when he comes back and lives up to what he's actually called to do that he makes a difference. That's the way it is with us, man. 
You're a believer in Jesus. God's got, God saved you for a reason, right? So you look at Elijah. He, he answers this call, and he, he begins to follow, and he follows, he, he follows Elijah, we know, for at least six years, just being his servant. And then it gets to 2 Kings chapter 2. It says that the time came for the Lord to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me on to Bethel. In other words, somehow Elisha knows, oh, man, Elijah, he's fixing to die. And so they're in this town called Bethel. And Elijah says, hey, you stay here. Elijah goes, no, I ain't staying here, man. I'm going with you all the way. They go to a town called Gilgal. They get there. Elijah says, oh, you better stay here. Elijah says, no, man, I'm going with you. They get to Jericho. Basically, they're retracing the steps that Moses took when he entered into the promised land. They get to Jericho. Fifty prophets in Jericho, they said, hey, did you know that Elijah's going home today? Elijah said, yeah, I know it. Don't say anything to him. Elijah says, you better stay here. They go down to the Jordan River. Elijah says, you better stay here. Elijah says, no, I'm going with you. This is verse 7. Fifty men of the son of prophets could, came and stood, observing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, remember that, rolled it up, struck the water, which then parted to the right and left, and they crossed over on dry ground. It was like Moses entered into the promised land. Now they're going out of the promised land. And when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elijah answered, let me have two shares of your spirit. Give me a double portion of your spirit. Maybe Elisha is thinking like he's the spiritual son of Elijah. The firstborn son would receive a double portion. Elisha's like, bro, if you want me to be a prophet, I need twice of whatever you got. Give me a double portion, Elijah. Elijah said, you've asked for something difficult, but if you see me being taken away from you, you will have it. If not, you won't. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven and the whirlwind. As Elisha watched, he kept crying out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, a chariot and horse of fire, the Lord's army came down. And swept, raptured Elijah up into heaven, never to taste death. And Elisha is crying out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. When they could see him no longer, he took hold of his own clothes, tore them in two in an act of grief. Verse 13, picked up the mantle that had fallen off Elijah. He went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle, Elijah dropped and struck the water saying, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He asked, he struck the water and it parted to the right. And to the left, and Elijah crossed over on dry ground back into the promised land. When the sons of the prophets from Jericho who were observing saw it, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. When Moses was born, he was pulled out of the water. His name was to deliver or to pull out Moses. God called him to deliver the nation of Israel, and he pulled them out, but he was not able to take them into the promised land. No, that passed to his successor, Joshua, whose name means the Lord saves. It was Joshua who took them into the promised land. Elijah came along and he was called by God to deliver the nation of Israel from Baal, but he was unable to do it in his lifetime. No, that was passed on to Elisha to accomplish that, which means God saves. Elisha, God, God, Yahweh saves. John the Baptist, it says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, that Elijah will come again, someone in the spirit of Elijah. And Jesus says in the book of Matthew, if you can believe it, that John the Baptist was Elijah. So John the Baptist came preaching a repentance, a salvation through, or not salvation, but a repentance, a turning away from your sin. But John the Baptist could not take anybody in. Oh, no, no, that was left to Jesus which is the Greek name of Joshua, which means the Lord saves. It was only Jesus that could actually take someone in. Why? Because God had a successor. All I want to say to you is if you're a believer in this room today, God's given you a mantle. He's given you the knowledge, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's given you the spirit of God, the same spirit that rested upon Elijah 
rested upon Elisha, rested upon Andrew, rested upon Peter. And if you're a believer, it rests upon you. It's not in the person, it's in the God that we serve. And should you choose to surrender yourself wholly unto God and do what he wants to do, then the mantle's been placed upon you. And in 2023, he wants you to take that mantle and pass it on to somebody else. You are so important. You possess the spirit and the gospel and the knowledge. And God is asking you to live in such a way that that mantle that's been placed upon you could be passed on to someone else. Your kids, your grandkids, your student ministry, your friends, somebody you're affiliated with. And God will do it through you if you surrender your life to him because that's the desire of Jesus, the body of Christ, to pass on the good news to the next generation. We get to be a part. We get to be a part in 2023. I'm going to pray for us. Ty and Greg are going to come up and dismiss us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the example of Elijah and Elisha and how the same spirit that was on Elijah was passed on to Elisha. That same spirit resides in us. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Glorify God with the way you live. Father, might we make a spiritual decision today to follow Jesus no matter the cost, that you might be glorified in the way we live, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.